Oh, hey there. Welcome to the Nerdy About Nature podchat series, where I sit down with folks from different backgrounds and experiences to chat all about things pertaining to nature. My name is Ross, and this podcast is an extension of a passion project I started called Nerdy About Nature, which also includes tons of fun educational videos all over Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and basically everywhere else on the internet. Now, all that I create here serves as a means to inspire, educate, and engage folks with the outdoor world so that we can all become better stewards of it, have a little bit more fun when we're out enjoying it, and work to create a more inclusive, diverse, equitable, and just future for each and every one of us in this world that we all share. Because nature, it sure is pretty neat, and I think we should keep it that way. So come on, let's go get nerdy. Come and take a nature walk with me, we're gonna check out some really cool trees, we're gonna hang around and talk about all those things in nature that we can't live without. Let's go get nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, baby. Nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Come on, let's get nerdy about nature. What's up, nerds? How you doing? Uh, today is an absolute heater of an episode. I am so stoked to share it with you. Uh, today we're chatting all about geomorphology, that is, the study of how the earth and landscapes change over time under influence from different forces or events like volcanoes, tectonic plate movements, earthquakes, glaciers, etc. And specifically, we're going to be chatting about the geomorphology in the Sea to Sky Corridor in British Columbia. So from Vancouver, BC, up through Squamish to Whistler. So if you live in that area or frequent through it for biking, hiking, climbing, skiing, or whatever, learning about how these incredible lands came to be is surely going to be a treat. It's also very applicable to the broader geology across North America, but we're going to be talking about specific features in that Sea to Sky Corridor. Now, I sat down with Pierre Freely, who is a bit of a legend in these parts, who recently won the Westerman Award for Outstanding Achievement in Geoscience for his work in identifying natural geologic hazards in the area. And as a top researcher in the field, his work has appeared in 22 papers in leading peer-reviewed journals and 14 additional papers in books. He's incredibly knowledgeable on the subject and I did my absolute best here to hang on tight through our conversation to follow all he was saying while reiterating it back in the simplified terms for us all to understand these geomorphological processes much better. So how do mountains grow, break down, and form? What carves out and shapes all these different fjords and canyons? What the heck is a lahar or a terminal moraine? And what sort of natural geological hazards exist around us today? Well buckle up because we're about to dive in and learn all about that and more. Here we go. Yeah, so welcome to the podcast. Super stoked to have you here. Really appreciate you coming on such short notice here. Um, really excited to have you on. Would you mind starting us off by giving us a little bit of an introduction to who you are and what we're talking about today? So um, my name's Pierre Freely. I'm a an earth scientist living in Squamish. I've been in Squamish for 30 years or so. I was um, born on Vancouver Island, Port Alberni. Oh, nice. Yeah. And grew up in Whistler and went to school in Pemberton. So I've been living in the Sea to Sky Corridor all my life. And um, I ended up uh, not just basically following my nose in university and and, uh, and uh, tapping into uh, physical geography and earth science as a career. And so when I landed in Squamish, uh, I was just bound and determined to understand everything I saw. So I've been kind of digging around and... and exploring and and uncovering the history of Squamish for 30 years or so. Literally digging around. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Do you remember when you first got, like, was there a moment when you were first, like, really interested in landscapes and geology where you just like, oh, like, was there a time when you're, like, digging as a young kid, like, building bike jumps or something? Uh, well, there was always that, but uh, uh, as a kind of a professional interest, when I ended up at UBC, I was in the geography department, um, and I, as I said, I followed my nose and ended up in physical geography as an interest. Uh, in the geography reading room, there was these all these uh, shelves of journals, and the one um, journal is the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences, and I was co I was constantly, you know, during breaks, just combing through the Canadian Journal of Earth Science, looking for what are called quaternary history articles, uh, articles describing processes of uh, land formation during the glacial era. And so I read pretty much every paper there was. That was really the spark for me. Was, you were just interested in... Yeah, it was just, I found it really fascinating. And so I just read, 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 read 
Yeah. Yeah, because there's a massive history with glaciation here, which we'll we'll get to. Mm-hmm. Um, there's quite a quite a bit to talk about. We were talking just on the walk up here, and you're just already overwhelming me with so much great information. Let's start with just basic geology here. Um, what are the kind of different types of rock that exist in the world, and how are they formed? So you have um, sedimentary rock, which is uh, rock that's been um, ground into particles, small particles, sand, silt, clay, uh, gravels, that kind of thing, ends up in a, in a depositional environment, and then through time, and often time and pressure with burial, becomes lithified, which means turned to rock. And that process can be either with cement, uh, like cements like uh, calcium carbonate or silica cements, holding the particles together or with burial and pressure it just completely reorganizes the crystal structure and makes new rock like metamorphic or new igneous rock right so sedimentary rock i i didn't realize that there were like cements like natural cements i don't know yep yep so when we refer to like cement like concrete is that that's a that's a lime that's lime right and so calcium carbonate is lime so that is a common cement in nature as well interesting yeah um, so that sedimentary rock is the sort of a, the first kind. And then igneous or plutonic rock is, is rock that comes from the melting of, of, of rock at depth in the crust, usually deeper than 100 kilometers in depth. And then it rises uh, through the, the crust above, causing uplift often to form these plutonic features like the Stuwamish chief that we have behind us. So that's igneous rock. And then metamorphic rock is rock that's been modified by heat and pressure at depth. And it could either be igneous rock or it could be derived from sedimentary rock. Um, and the characteristic of metamorphic rock is you, you can usually see banding and, and, and irregular kind of flow patterns and recrystallization. So you have um, um, kind of crystals that are developed in a force field. So they're often elongated or sort of flat and platy or whatever. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's through the process of subduction where um, like sedimentary, for example, there's like a fluvial deposit that gets compressed and then subducted with time, heated up a bit, and then that like melts and forms something totally different mm-hmm. like limestone forming marble mm-hmm. yeah or sandstone forming quartzite quartzite yeah okay and what is sandstone that's just sandstone would be a, a sedimentary rock that's formed from sand so that could be sand deposited in a river environment or on a beach and or... is the, are the origins of that sand like it could be any type of sand yep Yep. Just when so when you have uplift of the landscape then immediately you have different forms of um, weathering, so mechanical or chemical or whatever, and that releases fine particles, and that then gets moved down slope by rivers and or, or worked by wind or, 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 or eroded by glaciers or whatever, and then deposited to a, a low elevation environment where it's deposited and becomes stable and then eventually gets incorporated into the rock cycle and becomes metamorphic rock. Um, what are some of those processes of weathering and erosion? You said mechanical and chemical, like what, what's that include? Uh, so chemical would be processes of uh, like acid rain, for instance, acidic rain. The rain that comes off the ocean comes in at a pH of around 6, and that's slightly acid. And so then that can um, affect the surface of the rock, leading to pitting that we see. For instance, if we look at the rock around us, there's very smooth rock that's been polished by the glacier, but then there's patches of the rock that are pitted, and that's produced by chemical weathering from acid rain. So like this stuff right here? Yep. Yep. Really? Yep. So Interesting. That, so that's happened over the 10,000 years since the ice left. You've had that degree of pitting, which might amount to about a centimeter, which yeah. isn't a ton. But and, and a centimeter in like the extreme, yep. if that, yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. And then so then the other one, uh, mechanical. Mechanical would be, for instance, the rock fall that we see on the chief there. Uh, that was caused by uh, extreme heating during the uh, 
July 2021 heat dome that we had. So we had a very large range in temperature that day, reaching 40 degrees Celsius. It was the first time we ever reached ever or recorded uh, 40 degrees Celsius in Squamish. And the minute it uh, reached 40 degrees Celsius, we had a rock fall on the other side over there on the north wall. Pretty significant one. Yeah, big one. And then and then that 40 degree heating or that ex extreme diurnal range that day um, created stresses in the rock, probably broke bridges on joints and stuff, and then led to a protracted, protracted period of um, rockfall that happened over the course of the rest of that year and possibly extending a bit into 2022. So we, so that, that extreme diurnal range on that day with that high 40 degree temperature created a phase of rockfall activity. Right. Yeah. All kind of like initially weakened by that. And then like, as we were talking about before, there's like different types of weathering that can occur where you have like expansion of like water molecules in between the cracks maybe created during that hot spell that like continue to let things break down. Yeah. And freeze thaw. Yeah. yeah. So you'll have water in the cracks and then you'll have the temperature going from above zero to below zero. The crystals, water crystals grow, they expand 7% and that, that can bust off rock or you can have tree roots growing into cracks and getting bigger with time and then maybe some levering during a windstorm or something and that can jack off oh um, it can like pry it off pry off a, yeah. a big hunk so there's all sorts of processes like that wild yeah i i'm still just <laughs> this lost thinking about the rain i always because i knew rain caused erosion i didn't realize it was from like the acidity of the actual rain i thought it was like more of like a physical um like the pitter patter of the rain over time and then like even carrying fine sediments down with it kind of acting as like a sandpaper is that oh that would happen in more in like a riverine environment where the river's transporting sediment especially the larger um particle sizes like uh, pebbles, cobbles, and boulders, and they're trundling down the stream and causing direct like percussive impacts and, and breaking um, breaking the rock uh, so underneath. More, yeah, and like streams oh, and rivers, not necessarily just like general rainflow would yeah, be doing that. Or with extreme flows like in, in, in very large uh, catastrophic flood environments like uh, 10,000 years ago, coming down the Chequemus River, we had a catastrophic uh, glacial lake outburst flood, and the flow depths were absolutely immense, filling the Chequemus River Valley, and that would cause direct plucking. So it would uh, exploit the joints, the, the, the rock joints and structure, and rip out huge fragments and cause extreme mechanical erosion during these catastrophic type of um, geomorphic events. And how long ago was that? Uh, we have preliminary dates. It's a project I'm working on. It uh, probably around 10,500 years ago, just as the ice was leaving the landscape. Yeah, so just, yeah. just post-glaciation. Yeah. So there probably wasn't like a lot of um, like tree roots or vegetation. Nothing. Even, like, nope. you know, it was prior to like all that succession. Yeah. Interesting. So before we kind of get into the Squamish Valley and talking about everything behind us here, um, let's talk about just kind of general, broader Cascadia. You came with a little bit of a, a cheat sheet you've got. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just to, I'm a I'm a more of a quaternary geoscientist. I'm interested in processes since um, or during and since glaciation. So the deeper Earth past uh, is not quite more forte. But anyways, the um, well, just before what, what when you say quatern quaternary. Quaternary. Quatern quaternary. Yeah. Uh, what's that refer to? That's like a. That's the time period uh, that encompasses the periods uh, that the 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 glacial uh, periods that affected the Earth. So uh, it extends roughly from say two and a half million years ago to ten thousand years ago, and during that time there were gl glacial episodes every a uh, hundred thousand years, and so over you know every uh t every million years you'd have roughly 10 glacial episodes so over 2 million years you had 20 glacial episodes globally on the earth whether it's europe asia or the americas um because each glaciation removes evidence of the previous we maybe have good sort of descriptions of the last four episodes but the last episode in this area is called the Fraser Glaciation, and, and we we understand that fairly well because we can see its direct evidence. Mm -hmm. And that was the most recent one with the Cordillerian 
Is that, am I saying that right? It's called the Fraser Glaciation yeah. locally. So in the Coast Mountains, uh, we have what's called the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. Okay. And you, so it's, pronoun it's pronounced with a, a Y as the Spanish. Like, so we have the, the mountains that extend from like the southern South America to the St. Elias Range in Alaska is called the Cordillera. So, we, so okay. we have mountains that extend all the way. That's funny. I've only ever seen that word written. So. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a, originally a Spanish word. So it's pronounced Cordillera. And so then the glaciation that was on those mountains is called the Cordilleran glaciation. And then on the interior of the um, um, Canadian shield uh, centered on, uh, on Hudson's Bay, is the Laurentide ice sheet. So you had the Laurentide ice sheet and the Cordilleran ice sheet, and they kind of were acting somewhat independently of one another. But kind of divided by the Rockies. Uh, yes, the east side of the Rockies was the division between the two right. uh, ice sheets. Okay. So then, so you your studies kind of basically focus on what's happened on the direct landscape as a result of all that glaciation versus the stuff that happened like like because the question that i sent you an email about like asking about like how all these rocks came to be here in the first place mm -hmm. that's kind of outside your range well it, it is but i mean it's basic and fundamental so we you know we 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 have a handle on the simple part of that but not necessarily the fine yeah. the fine details yeah yeah I can't imagine yeah. even trying to figure any of this stuff out. Uh -huh. Like it's just, yeah. it's like working, it's like doing CSI on something that happened billions of years ago. Right. Yeah, it's using all sorts of um, uh, dating techniques and raw and and um, and rock like geochemistry. Like yeah, a lot of very um, sophisticated sort of stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, so let's get into it. Mm -hmm. How did all this get here? Okay. <laughs> So the uh, the the basic elements of the of the landscape uh, say we have the Canadian Shield and then uh, a j jump back. Just everybody's familiar with Pangaea and how there were large supercontinents at one time and then they they break up and then they reform. So Pangaea was one of the last supercontinents and it started to break up about 350 million years ago and then the the major continental plates kind of moved apart but then we have the processes of plate tectonics so we have convergent margins spreading margins we happen to live on a, a convergent margin where there's subduction of the oceanic plate under the continental plate and so with the with the breakup of Pangaea it sort of set up an, a rift zone in the deep ocean in the middle of the Pacific so you have spreading and then that rock that's spreading away from that rift has to go somewhere. It, uh, it runs into the continental plate, and then it's because it's heavier, it's got more iron in it versus the continental plate's lighter, it has more silica in it. it the heavier ocean plate wants to dive underneath, and so it starts subducting under the continental plate. And then uh, you can envision Japan. Japan is what we call an island arc. So there's like a spreading center, there's a hot spot in the ocean plate and a landmass accumulates through volcanism and then you have erosion and the production of sedimentary rocks and then you may have coral reefs and stuff like that. So you get an assemblage of different rock types that are associated with an, a volcanic island arc situation. So you, then you can imagine like an island arc moving on the oceanic plate and then, up, and then running into the continental plate and it's on the surface of this subducting slab, and so it just accumulates on the edge of the continent. And so through millions of years, you get a number of these island arc uh, landforms being basically scraped off and accumulating on the west side of the, the, uh, the continental crust. And then so then our coastline migrates outwards from the Rocky Mountains, and then it migrates outwards to the coastline as we know it today. And the, the most recent of those accumulating terrains is called Rangelia, and it docked it, so it arrived on the continent and got jammed there uh, 100 million years ago. 
And then what happened is then the, the subduction zone shifts outward to the outside of Rangelia, which presently is about 150 kilometers off the shore of Vancouver Island. And the plate goes down and starts to melt at 100 uh, kilometers depth. And then we get magma rising up and pushing up through the, the crust um, to create the Cascadia subduction zone and the volcanoes that go up and down inland of the subduction zone. Okay, a lot, lot, lot happening there. <laughs> Trying to like visualize all of that. So, is is that are the are like oceanic plates having more iron and um, land plates like terrestrial plates having more silica? Is that a common thing all around the world? Yes, that's typical. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Okay. And then so what you're saying like Japan is like this island chain off the coast, and then eventually like that that is basically what happened here and what's formed all these ranges of mountains like you've had just like land masses arising and, and being pushed up just like kind of like a car crash of like different land masses essentially but in super slow motion yep. where like one hits another hits then it crumples and forms mountain range another hits behind it and it crumples and this most recent one is Rangalia and it's like what we're what we're currently kind of living on here in Cascadia mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. and so the the rate of um subduction or 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 like uh, of these these island arcs accumulating it's about five centimeters per year that's the order of magnitude um so centimeters per year is the order of magnitude of that convergent um so movement. It's, it's like moving over five centimeters a year mm -hmm. and then and then that with the subduction of the plate and the formation of magma and the rise of, of magma underneath that, all of it underneath yeah what's what's been docked um that creates uplift and the long-term uplift over the last hundred million years has been on the order of um 0.1 to 0.5 millimeters per year so the convergence is in centimeters per year and the uplift is in millimeters per year wow and then in combination with all that uplift happening, you have erosional forces, which are shedding the uplifted rock. Yeah. And then so the Cascadian uh, volcanic chain, which stems from like Northern California, Mount Shasta up through Oregon, Washington, and here into BC up to... Mount Meager, Pemberton. Is that the highest one in the chain? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's all the edge of the Cascadian subduction zone going under the North American plate. Mm -hmm. And those are created from like a series of like hot spots, I guess, through the mantle that allows magma to come up through. Yeah. So the, the subducting plate melts and then you get these, these bodies of, of melted rock that um, there's chemical separation going on, which again, that, those would be the details I'm not 100% familiar with, but you get sort of separation of the magmas into different phases. And then you get uh, lighter phases of rock rising up through um, the, the heavier rock and then and recrystallizing the rock as it, as it comes up and then finding fractures. And then if there's a fracture that will reach the surface, then um, that plutonic rock can then actually erupt through to the surface and reach the surface as a volcano. Yeah, so you have both the, the plutons that stay, that sort of maybe rise a bit and then cool and solidify and become features like the chief. Once all the material on top gets eroded off, then you expose that granite rock, which is, is that pluton. But in, if the volcanic rock managed to rise through a crack or something and erupt at the surface, then it becomes a volcanic rock or it becomes part of the volcano that we see back there, mm -hmm. um, Chekai. And is that just because of the rate of cooling that creates that? Or like, like so what we're standing on right now is granite yeah. that formed underneath landmass on top of it. But had it like been hot enough or found it in a way to escape to the surface, it would have become basalt? Yeah, then it would it would um, come to the surface as a volcanic rock. There's different kinds of volcanic rock. There's rhyolites, dacites, and basalts. Um, so they, depending on, the, they're classified according to their chemical composition and the magma that they're sourced from. Um, so they could be they could be any of those, but uh, often our volcan our volcanoes are um, 
more rhyolitic, meaning they're they're more silica rich and less iron rich, and that's because they're derived from these these uh, granite type rocks, which are also more silica rich. Okay. I'm just like grasping to kind of like keep up and follow here. Um, and then so with these volcanoes, because we've had a very active volcanic history throughout the region. Um, what types of different volcanoes are there? Because there's like um, hot spot volcanoes. Like I know there's one in Idaho where it's just kind of like bubbling to the surface versus like explosive events like Mount St. Helens in recent memory or Mount Mazama, former Mount Mazama. Um, down in Crater Lake, Oregon, which was at one point a volcano that exploded with such force that it just left a huge crater in the earth, which is crazy to envision. Um, what types of volcanoes are all these? So the uh, our Cascadian volcanoes are the eruptive kind. Um, the Hawaiian volcanoes are effusive kinds. Um, so they they ri- the, the lava rises to the surface slowly, and because it's very... Um, uh, uh, Again, I'm not a volcanologist, but it's uh, it's a more um, dark. It's more full of iron and stuff. It's a basalt, so it's not explosive. So it rises to the surface, and then it just flows out and and creates these flows, and that gradually build the land mass up and create the the Hawaiian vol- volcanic chain. Uh, whereas our magma, when it comes to the surface, it depressurizes rapidly, and doosh, it just creates a massive explosion. Interesting. So uh, the like Hawaiian Islands, that's like mostly coming from an oceanic plane. A hot, a hot spot. Yeah, mm-hmm. and a hot spot under the ocean crust. So that's why it's more rich in iron. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Mm-hmm. And then uh, other other kinds of volcanoes. So we have hot spot volcanoes as well. So once we get north of um, the Cascadia subduction zone, there's um, the Naz. Is it the Naz? The Nazco. Anyways, from uh, essentially from um, Bella Bella inland to Tweedsmere Park, there's a, a, a string of volcanoes that go kind of east-west, and those are produced from a hot spot rather than being produced from subduction. So we have different kinds of volcanoes in, in BC. And what exactly is a hot spot? So then you have, uh, like Hawaii, you have just, for some reason, you have a place under the crust that sits still and doesn't move over millions of years and it locally thins the crust and and magma can then rise through the crust and come to the surface. And the crust is, because of plate tectonics, the crust is moving, but the the heat source with deep within the earth isn't moving. So then as the as the crust moves over the hot spot it creates a chain of volcanoes. Okay, so there's a chain north of here in BC of, of uh, east to west volcanoes, just like Hawaii is kind of like with Mauna Kea being the one that's currently active, the big island. And then, oh, okay, that's just all making sense to me now. So Kauai would have been like the earliest island. Yeah, so big island is the active island. So it's it's where the you know, where the volcano is most tall and, and most broad. And then as you go... Uh, west through the Hawaiian chain, it get things get progressively more eroded and old and diminished in size, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. why like Mauna Kea is like this big triangular mound versus Kauai being like really steep, jagged rock because and smaller because it's all just kind of eroded as it's drifted away. Interesting. Didn't realize we'd be talking about Hawaii so much. That's cool. So within this period of glaciation. So we, we have everything that's formed here, or we know where this landmass comes from. And then what impact has the glaciers had? So the, the gla- glaciers are, um, they're, they've accumulated during the, the uh, peak of glaciation, there was maybe 1,500 to 2,000 meters of ice covering the landscape. So when we look to our um, west over here, we see very rounded ridges and they're, um, less, you know, there may be 1,400 meters elevation, so they were covered by the ice, and so they've been rounded by the ice. Uh, and then when you get into the bigger mountains up in the Tantalus range, they're anywhere from 
um, 2,000 to 2,500 meters in elevation. So they poked above the ice as what we call nun attacks. And so they're, rather than rounded, they're jagged. And so the transition from rounded ridges to jagged peaks gives us, that's how we actually are able to measure what the thickness of the ice was at one time. And so that thickness of ice um, weighs a lot, of course, and then it depresses the Earth's crust down. So you could have 100 meters or 200 meters of subsidence, uh, the, the land subsiding under that weight. Um, and then what that, what that can do is actually cause fissures and cracks. And that, those fissures and cracks can tap into these magma chambers. And so that's one thing that happened here well, in, in Canada, really, be, well, in the, like in our Canadian Cascade volcanoes, is we have this phenomenon that we refer to. It's a similar in Iceland, um, fire and ice. So when the glaciers are, are, you know, expanding and contracting, the earth is getting worked through this, the weight is called isostatic response. It either goes down with the weight or responds, bounces back when the, when the weight's taken away and that creates these cracks and we get volcanism associated with that. So looking back to Mount Garibaldi, check high, um, it's very unique because during the peak of the last glaciation, which was 15,000 years ago, the, uh, volcanism at Chakai was active and so the volcano actually grew and built out or grew through the ice and then built out onto the ice so there was a big classic conical volcano built on the ice during the peak of the glaciation and then when the glaciers melted back by 10,000 years ago there was nothing supporting all that rock so it collapsed and cl and, and then collapsed and and filled the whole Squamish Valley so this isostatic adjustment is a, a, a very prominent feature as a, a, as a result of glaciation. And that leads to changes in, for instance, sea level. When the ice is pressing the earth down, the, the ocean waters can be much higher. And so then when the ice initially leaves, the water floods into a much higher elevation than it is today. And then the land bounces back and the sea level falls rapidly. So that's called relative sea level change. And so in the Vancouver area, uh, sea level was 200 meters higher than it is today. So many of the valleys have deltas that are at 200 meters elevation. Whereas in Squamish, the ice left later. The, the ice retreated off the continental shelf and then it retreated into the Strait of Georgia and it retreated up the fjords. And so there was a, you know, it took time for all that to happen from, say, 13,000 years ago to um, 11,000 years ago, that process took several thousand years. So the areas that were deglaciated last, they had already experienced some isostatic uplift by the time the ocean waters were able to flood in. So again, Vancouver had sea level of um, uh, what we call a marine limit of 200 meters elevation, whereas in Squamish, our marine limit's 50 meters elevation. So looking over to the... the uh, camping area at the base of the chief um, that is a flat surface formed by um, the former river meeting the sea and that flat surface that forms the campground is at 50 meters elevation so that's the marine limit in Squamish. So that was like the highest that the water ever got yeah. here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to backtrack just a bit just to recap that for people um, <laughs> and, and for myself to clarify that. So Two kilometers of ice on top of these mountains and the mountains that were fully covered in ice are the rounded ones because as that ice retreated and melted out, it basically ground the top of those mountains down and rounded them versus anything sticking above it kind of has a more jagged approach, kind of like a knife cutting through the ice as it retreated. Okay. Yeah, and a road, just a road, like there'll be glaciers on the flanks of the mountains. And glaciers, there's something within, uh, there's something that's studied. Uh, the, the, the erosive action of glaciers is, is, it can be quite significant. And so there's something called the glacial buzzsaw effect. And so glaciers are sliding, and it's almost like you can envision a circular saw just grinding away. So these cirques are just getting kind of eaten, eaten away from one side of ridge and the other, and it creates this very steep, um, steep flanked ridge called an arete. 
right? So that's produced by this glacial buzzsaw effect. And so arets and cirques, like those very iconic, like knife edges, like that's created from just rapid, like glaciers every year, chewing it up. Yeah. And then, um, then you have things like tarns and moraines, like tell me how those are formed. So when the, this glacial buzzsaw is chewing away at the, at the, the head wall of the cirque, the forming the aret on the ridge, that those sediments are then spat out on the downstream side and then accumulating at the toe of the glacier to make uh, a sharp sided uh, sedimentary feature called a moraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's there's different types of moraines. There's terminal moraines and what's the other one? Well, there's lateral, terminal, ablation. Yeah, different kinds. Just different contexts of um, material being dumped by glaciers. Um, uh, the moraine can be at the very bottom of the ice, in which case it's really compressed and hard or it can be on the ice and then the ice melts away and then it's a loose jumble. So then it's very loose and maybe full of depressions, which we call kettle lakes. Um, or it could be in these marginal uh, environments that we call sort of proper moraines. They could be lateral on the side or they could be at the end or terminal, mm -hmm. right? And so like yeah. lateral, lateral moraines, there's like when you see photos of glaciers up in like Alaska or something where you, there's those big, like they kind of look like channels coming like down, going to the ocean, like the, on the sides, that would be a lateral moraine. Okay. Okay. Um, isostatic. Isostatic drift, or what is it? Uh, isostatic uplift or subsidence. Isostatic yeah. uplift. So that's basically the weight of the ice on the earth, like... Flexor. Causes flexure. Flex, yeah, yeah, flexes the earth down with so much weight, and then as that ice retreats or melts, it, like, rebounds up, and then that movement up and down creates cracks that allows for magna, magma to seep through? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Blowing my mind. Um, and so the magma seeping through, uh, well, an example of that is looking across to, again to the Stowamish Chief, and you see this prominent feature running right up the wall of the Stowamish Chief. It's called the Black Dyke, and that is um, a volcanic uh, intrusion into the, into the igneous rock, into that pluton. So the, the Chief is a big um, hunk of intrusive rock. Right, that was formed underneath landmass, and then through that isostatic... Well, then through just general mountain building and uplift, and then always associated with uplift, there's erosion. So then gradually all of that surface rock that was originally there overlying the plutonic rock has been then eroded away, leaving just that plutonic rock as a, as a feature in the landscape. Okay. That, yeah, that's how it has become what it is now. But back when it was covered in earth, that's what created the crack that then got filled with... With a, 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 a basalt fill, a volcanic fill. Okay, that's all incredibly, incredibly interesting. And then, so speaking to Squamish specifically here, you were mentioning earlier that the old fjord, because we're currently at like the mouth of the fjord here where the Squamish River meets the ocean. Mm-hmm. But it used to exist way up the valley. Mm -hmm. So uh, valley glaciers, when they're streaming out of the mountains, carve, again, this kind of glacial buzzsaw thing. They carve deep, uh, fj like the, f the fjord is, they're often very deep, like 400 meters deep or whatever. And then once you get beyond the most erosive part of, of that gl valley glacier, then you might have a shallower ocean situation beyond that so the fjords are often very deep and they extend a long way inland like night inlet on the bc coast is like 90 miles long or something um anyway so in squamish when the ice left um after um the younger dryas which was a, a, a time period uh, at the end of the last glaciation about eleven and a half thousand years ago when the ice finally pulled away the fjord extended all the way up to the confluence of the Ashloo River and the Squamish River. And that's about 20 um, kilometers, 20 miles, 20 miles up from the beach. The current so, beach. Yeah, the current yeah. beach. The miles are in my head because the loggers, Squamish is a logging town, and uh, everything's measured in distance from the beach because the logs would be brought to the beach. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. 
So the Ashloo was about 20 miles from the beach. And so the fjord was that much longer. And so in the 10,000 years since the ice left, the fjord is gradually filled in as the rivers, the Ashloo, the Elaho, and the Upper Squamish brought sediment in to the fjord and built the delta gradually downstream till in the last thousand years the delta is where it is now and so we're actually the town of squamish has developed on a very young landform mm. and when um the glaciers retreated and garibaldi collapsed the chikai fan you mentioned like so that's all that land that comes out there kind of around yeah, so if you're if, if, if you're looking back this way, you can see Chakai or the European name Mount Garibaldi um, comes down, and then there's this hill in the foreground, the sort of middle ground there that's below the ridge. That's called the Bex Hill, and just on the other side of the Bex Hill is the apex of a landform called the Chikai Fan, which is a big alluvial fan formed from landslides and debris flows that have come off Chakai. And the Chikai fan formed very rapidly once the ice left and, and essentially filled the fjord and then filled right across the fjord to reach the other side. And in effect, what it created was a, a lake upstream of the Chikai fan. So you have the Squamish f fjord originally extends up to Ashloo confluence. And then the Chikai fan comes down and forms this massive feature across the fjord, isolating a lake on the upstream side. And then that lake took um, 7,000 years to fill in and, and then gradually evolved from a, like a deep lake to a shallow lake and then wetlands and then gradually just became a floodplain forest. And that's what we know today. And that's only existed really for the last thousand years or so that seems like a relatively quick time just uh, it, like the scale like seven thousand years to fill a lake that big like it seems like that's that seems fast yeah uh, well again the the mountains in the headwaters are all glaciated and so um in the in, glaciated mountains have a lot of debris and they and so there's a, a high sediment yield in in those mountain environments and then, and then everything that exists here now has all just been spit out from continued glaciation and erosion coming down to form the delta that is today. Yes, and then also a, a major component of the mountains, or I, maybe a, not a major component in, in their aerial coverage, but a major component because the rock is much weaker, is the volcanic rock. And so volcanic rock has a much higher sediment production rate than the igneous rock. So a large proportion of the rock that forms those valley fills uh, would come from the, the volcanic landscapes in, in the watershed. Crazy, a lot happening. And so today, like things seem relatively stagnant. Um, is that true? Uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that's, uh, well, put it this way, that, that, that leads me to need to explain another phenomenon. There's something called the paraglacial paradigm. So when the glaciers are grinding and doing their work and they're in the landscape, there's, there's going to be soil or, or freshly ground dirt between the ice and the rock kind of mushed up high on the, on the mountain sides. And so when the ice finally leaves, so there's all this dirt that's in unstable positions in the landscape. So it needs to get, it, it, it gets flushed out very rapidly. And so between 10, like when the ice leaves, say 11,000 years, 10, 11,000 years ago, and about 7,000 years ago, there's this massive flush of sediment. And then gradually it tapers off and asymptotes to what we call the normal sediment yield rate. So that period of high sediment production is called the paraglacial period. And so when we look at something like the Chikai fan in Squamish, probably more than 70% of the, it's a massive landform. It's got a, 
I, you know, I can't spout the numbers off the top of my head, but it's a massive landform. It's like three kilometers in, in radius and, uh, you know, a hundred, 200 meters thickness. Deep enough to fill a fjord. Deep enough to fill a fjord. And 70% of that material or 80% came down with, you know, by 7,000 years ago. And really only in the last 7,000 years, only about 10 meters of accumulation has occurred on the surface of the fan. So there's this huge sediment pulse and then it diminishes to, to what it is today which is just uh, like a, a very minor amount of what it was in the past so um that's the context but we still have big events occurring like these rock falls that we see behind us right so we get it seems like it's kind of a low on average sediment yield rate but it's punctuated by cataclysmic events like rock falls or big landslides on on check high um uh or perhaps mega thrust earthquake phenomenon or whatever so so there's in in geomorphology there's there was a debate you know is the world created by long-term uh low yield processes that was called uniformitarianism or were you a catastrophist yeah. And you were one or the other back in the 1800s and you fought hard and heavy about it. But nowadays, both are true. Yeah. It's kind of a blend of both. Yeah. It's like long, so pro long, slow processes that happen in between these big cataclysmic events. Yeah. And then like biotically just looking at this, because like when this happened, when the glacier first retreated, there were no trees here. Like alders would have been like one of the first pioneer species, just like we see happening up north. Like pine, yeah, pine coming in to kind of like or, or like fill the gap so that things could life to create like a soil mixture that had like some organic matter in it that allowed other life to continue to grow and flourish. But that is like relatively so small compared to the amount of material that comes from all of the mechanical geological processes happening around here. Mm -hmm. So soil forming processes, um, typically our duff layer is 30 centimeters thick on the coast, something like that. And then you have what are called pods all soils in a rainy environment where you have lots of rain, it's slightly acid, causes leaching in the surface horizon, and that leached minerals get brought down to depth and so we typically see about 70 centimeters to a meter in a stable in an area that's been stable for a long time for many thousands of years without being affected by some other kind of process you have deep uh, orange reddening of that upper soil profile and that's called a pods all soil so our 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 pedogenic soils are typically an organic horizon that's maybe 30 centimeters thick and then um, an A and a B horizon that might be up to a meter thick. And that's formed on what we call the parent material. Yeah. So relatively thin soil levels here. Mm -hmm. Pretty shallow. Because mm -hmm. it's also fresh, also new. Yeah. So if you were to contrast that with going down to the United States or somewhere in Africa or where there has not been glaciation, then there chemical weathering has been affecting the ground for hundreds of millions of years. And you could have weathered uh, rock that's very, very deep. Yeah. And you f get things called laterites, for instance, which are just deeply weathered rock. Uh, do, are you familiar much with like on the east side of the continent, like those soils and like how that all formed through it's, glaciation? Well, it's 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 very similar. Like so, when when you're in a rainy environment where where precipitation exceeds evaporation, you the sort of the typical uh, soil is called a podzol, and you'll find that in any uh, part of the world where rainfall exceeds evaporation. And then in the grasslands in the center of continents. In the steppes and the grasslands, like rain um, shadows, and you have evaporation that's dominant, and so that's typically rather than things being leached down, it's minerals being brought up through through kind of processes of evaporation and suction and so on, and um, and then you get the precipitation of carbonate, and then you get fire regular fires that burn the organics and accumulate a nice humic uh, soil, and so you get these soils all through like Ukraine and through Canada and the, and the Midwest and the United States that are like these rich kind of 
black humic soils on top of the substrate. And those, those are called chernozemic soils. And those are, per, you know, at, like perfect for agriculture. Right. So, mm-hmm. And that's where like the bread basket of like North America all kind of exists there because the soils are yeah. perfect for it. Yeah. yeah. Until depleted by a hundred years of intensive agriculture. Yeah. Industrial agriculture has done yeah. wonders on that, hasn't <laughs> it? We we talked a little bit before we started rolling um, about lahars. You want to talk to me about a lahar? What is what is that, and what kind of influence has that had? Okay, so um, that is uh, critical for people living in Squamish. The the con- so a lahar is a essentially just a volcanic landslide. Uh, more specifically, perhaps a, a volcanic uh, avalanche or debris flow. And if you're a stickler or a, a splitter, you would use the term strictly only for pyroclastic, like so hot molten rock that's coming off a, an exploding volcano. So you get these pyroclastic density currents, they're called. They're hot gases and, and hot rock that's coming down the mountain in a, in a massive avalanche. And that would be the type of event that buried Pompeii um, at Vesuvius and um, and preserved everything, you know, kind of left casts of everything and, you know, just preserved everything. Yeah, so, that, so then you have a hot lahars and, and the sort of volcanologists tend to restrict the use of the word lahar to that, whereas... Uh, a geomorphologist like myself who's in, interested in landslides, I use the word more broadly to include any landslide off a volcano. And so on Chakai Mountain, uh, there's it, the, it was last active uh, volcanically um, 10,000 years ago. And since then, it's really just been subject to collapses that are just the cold volcanic rock um, off that steep face that we can see there or some of the ridges that come off of it. You get these massive landslides that form and, uh, and, and they collapse into the, the confining valley and then they'll propagate into a debris flow, like so a flowing material that comes out and then spreads out on the Chikai fan down there. So those are our big lahars. The last lahar that affected Squamish was um, 870 years ago, and it was a landslide that was uh, 3 million cubic meters in volume and would have covered a a huge area in Brackendale. Yeah, that's really not that long ago. No, no. And and it would have came down, it would have come down following the same path through the valley there and just like just spreading out further from the previous slides. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And lahars are a really prominent uh, shaping feature here throughout Cascadia. I, mean, I remember looking at a map um, of Mount Rainier and like all the different lahars that have come out, like the cowlitz and stuff into present day Tacoma. Um, like, Yeah. So the classic example on Rainier is something called the Osceola mud flow. And it happened roughly 5,000 years ago. And it was a massive event. I, I can't remember the volume, but it would have been in the in the tens of millions to hundreds of millions of cubic meters in volume. And it traveled uh, from Mount Rainier all the way to Tacoma and reached Puget Sound and spread out over an area of like 200 square kilometers or something like that. So if that were to happen today, uh, it would completely destroy, well, it would kill millions of people and destroy, uh, you know, a, a huge amount of infrastructure and cost billions and billions and billions of dollars in damages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because those yeah. low valley bottoms are great places to build. Yeah. Great for <laughs> suburban sprawl. Yeah. Um, was Tacoma, so what present day Tacoma wasn't even there. Like that, that Lahar basically created present day Tacoma. Yeah. By guess, filling in that. Yeah, you could say delta. that. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, why is geomorphology like what kind of what sort of work do you do here locally and why is why is it important to understand these geomorphological processes um well so my works um my training is about all that we've been talking about which is the formation of the land kind of as we know and see it today uh so understanding those processes at work and the deposits they leave behind and reconstructing that history so we can figure out what happened and with respect to say landslides we can figure out how big and how often they occur so that that's a hazard 
right? How big and how often is a hazard that may affect us? Um, so my job professionally is, is basically understanding hazards in the landscape and how they affect human development in any of its manifestations. So it could be uh, residential development, whether you want to build a house or create a new subdivision, um, that kind of thing. Um, or in forestry, for example, when roads are being built in the mountains and cut blocks are being laid out, if those cut blocks or roads are in terrain that's steep or unstable or whatever, then um, we assess the ground and then make recommendations to modify layout and that kind of thing. So, or if you're, another thing that happens in this neck of the woods is the development of run of, run of river hydro projects. And they're always up in the mountains. And so they'll be in areas that are subject to landslide or rockfall activity or snow avalanches or whatever. So then you've got your your intake weirs, your pen stocks and your powerhouses that, and your transmission lines that may be vulnerable to the types of um, hazards that exist in these mountains. And like, and more run of river um, operations and, and even logging. If you're worried about someone clearing land on a steep slope, clearing land on like a steep granite slope that doesn't have any landslide history is probably like safer, quote unquote, in theory, than doing it on like something that is like uh, a lot looser sediment that might be prone to more landslides. Uh, well, th so that, that could be true, but um, what's actually pretty amazing is here, even though we are on the coast, we're, we're leeward of Vancouver Island um, and we're in a fjord a little ways. So the more you move away from the very outer coast, the drier it pro progressively gets. So the climate here, even though it's maritime, it's still somewhat dry compared to Port Hardy or Prince Rupert. So if you're anywhere on the outer coast in what we call the hyper maritime, then you have steep rock like you see on the Chief. It's very smooth, but amazingly it grows vegetation so they'll be they'll be like a meter or anywhere from 30 centimeters to a meter of organic soil on hard polished bedrock and that organic soil grows a forest and it slides off regularly so when you go up and down the mid coast and and you just pay attention to the landscape you'll see landslides very commonly so even though it's steep rock like you said it's still grows vegetation and it still landslides. Mm -hmm. But those landslides will be predominantly organic landslides rather mm -hmm. than than rock land or debris landslides. Uh, well, that's why it's so important to like know what you're working on before logging it because that would change the hydrology of the whole area and probably result in more landslides. Yes, I mean, it's, it's well understood that uh, just a simple act of cutting trees off the landscape increases the landslide hazard by... Uh, 10 times on average. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, even if it's well understood, it, you know, doesn't yeah. prevent it from happening still. Um, you recently, you won an award, an Outstanding Achievement in Geoscience Award. Tell me about that. What, what was that for? Uh, that was for... Um, it's a pretty big accolade. Yes. Uh, Congratulations. We, we don't, we don't uh, get recognition unless we have boosters. So... I have to acknowledge my boosters, um, the, the people that nominated me. Uh, okay. So without our colleagues and our peers um, putting our names out there, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get recognized. And so I, 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 I have to thank John Clegg, who's a well-known ge geoscientist in, in Canada, um, and um, Matthias Jakob, who passed away uh, just last year. Uh, also a very well-known um, earth, earth scientist in, in Canada and the world. They were the kind of my primary supporters, so I, I thank them. But um, the Westerman Award is uh, given to a geoscientist who's contributed to their field, um, and especially in kind of public safety, around come public safety. So uh, my work has been studying... The, Chekai Mountain and Mount Meager. I've done a lot of work um, digging around at the in the foot slopes of those volcanoes, understanding their landslide history, and then uh, and then uh, that leads to understanding or predicting what the risk would be in any kind of residential 
uh, settings downstream of, of those volcanoes or to the, you know, people that might be working in industrial settings in the flanks of the volcanoes. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. To be recognized like that. Uh, how long have you been doing that work specifically? 30 years around here. Oh, so like the whole time you've been here has been in Yeah. That. Well, I moved to Squamish, um, 30 years ago and, um, there's a gravel pit on the way up to Quest University and, and it's also on the way up to Diamond Head if you're going skiing. And I would, you know, drive by there and see those materials that were exposed in that gravel pit. And I just had to figure out what was going on. And so that was 30 years ago. And um, I found, you know, there was there's some really interesting layers. And there's some organic layers that are buried deeply. And I knew that if I could get some carbon samples out of those organic layers I might be able to date that and then tell the story of you know what that gravel pit was you know the information that was contained there I that would reveal a story and I'd be able to tell that story so that kind of became a little passion to figure out what was going on so that was my first pit well it wasn't actually yeah it was um, that was my first paper. And then what that led to actually understanding is there's, um, off the backside of Chakai, there's a feature called the Opal Cone, which is a place where magma came to the surface just at the end of the last glaciation and, and lava flowed down Skookum Valley into the Mamquam and then all the way down the Mamquam and producing a landform we call the Ring Creek Lava Flow. And so we were able to figure out how old the Ring Creek Lava Flow was. By, and it, by that work. So and was, how old was it? 10,000 years, roughly. Yeah. Because this, this place was covered in glaciers <laughs> up until about 10,000 yeah, years ago. Yeah. So you do a lot of digging, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, or, or cleaning up exposures that already exist. Yeah. So looking at gravel pits, looking at road cuts, looking at river banks. Um, and then uh, where you don't have exposures, then you might have a big excavator on hand and you dig deep test pits. Yeah. What's been some of the coolest stuff that you've discovered or found? Um, well, the, one of my most interesting projects was um, in, in exploring around M Mount Meager, there's, there's uh, landslide deposits that form valley fills on both sides of Mount Meager on the upper Lillooet and Meager Creek that are hundreds of meters thick. And, and the rivers have cut down through those landslide deposits, leaving exposures that are like 100, 150 meters tall with all sorts of different landslide units. And, and so I, over, you know, a few years in the early 2000s, described all those materials and, and, and realized that there were landslides there that were um, huge, absolutely huge, like on the order of um, like 100 million cubic um, meters in volume and they have the landslides of that volume 10 to the 8 in magnitude have the ability to travel downstream like this um, Osceola mud flow on Mount Rainier they have the ability to travel downstream hundreds of kilometers and so recognizing them around the volcano I was able to we wrote a paper John Clegg and I um, suggesting that Pemberton could be affected by one of these landslides and then a few years later, um, there was some work going on up at Mount Meager and we got a little grant. So we um, hired a drill rig and I, because I grew up around here, I could contact a whole bunch of the local farmers and get access to their properties. And so we took this drill rig onto a whole bunch of uh, farmers fields anywhere from 30 kilometers to 60 kilometers downstream of the volcano and drilled a whole bunch of holes. And we ended up documenting uh, volcanic debris flows anywhere from, as I say, 30 to 50 kilometers downstream from the volcano. Um, so we were able to reconstruct um, every 2,000 years, a massive landslide would come from Mount Meager and essentially wipe out the Pemberton Valley. And uh, so we were able, we, we published on that. And, um, and then having that realization, we produced another paper that uh, talked about the risk to residents living in the Pemberton Valley. And when you compare that estimated risk level to what are internationally accepted levels of risk tolerance, it's unacceptable. So we published a paper that said, oh, the, it, it, it's really unacceptable <laughs> to be living in Pemberton yeah. sort of thing. And then uh, <laughs> a couple of years later, there was the Meager Creek landslide that 
was a very large landslide and um, didn't affect Pemberton per se, but it it blocked the valley, created a, a lake behind the landslide. Then there was a um, an, a landslide-induced outburst flood, and that flood affected the Pemberton Valley. Yeah, so still very geologically active. Yes. Would, would that landslide have classified in the every 2,000 years? Uh, it's not big enough. Not big enough. So yeah. when was the last one? Uh, the last big one was um, a s- sort of around the time of the last eruption of Mount Meager. Chekai Mountain here hasn't been active for 10,000 years, and there's no real evidence of any bubbling magma below it. But Mount Meager has bubbling magma below it, and it was last active. Uh, it erupted catastrophically 2,400 years ago. Um, and so there was, I think, although it uh, anyways, from the dating I've done, I think that this massive landslide slightly proceeded the eruption. So there might have been, often magma will come up into the crust and cause the mountains to bulge and deform. And that, that process can cause a landslide. And so that may have what hap- that may be what, what happened. But anyways, this, so this massive landslide came down, say, 24, 2,500 years ago and filled the entire... Uh, Pemberton Valley downstream as far as um, uh, Ronan's Farm, if you want to get specific. And uh, if you're if you're heading up the Pemberton Valley and, and you want to go over the Hurley Pass, you turn right and you and you go across the valley on this road and you cross a bridge that's called the Forestry Bridge. So on that road that goes um, perpendicular across the valley, there is uh, a landslide that's. Uh, a med- like the valley's maybe a kilometer, kilometer and a half wide. So the landslide fills the entire valley width to a depth of four meters. And that's 50 kilometers downstream. Wow. Yeah. It's just like the scale of that is so unfathomable. Like to, to see something like that happen, like has there in like recent human history, like around the world, has, have we witnessed events that huge? Um. Yeah. Well, I would say yes, but I'm, yeah, I wouldn't have any like in in Iceland. There's been um, ev- events like that. Certainly, like they travel fifty, sixty kilometers mm-hmm. down. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, because that's just like the scale. Like you, it's so hard to comprehend that. And what's why do those flows travel so far and fast? Like, is it a matter of like their composition or like the velocity that they're able to like release from? Yeah. It, well, it's uh, kind of all of those things. Um, uh, the Mount Meager landslide that happened in 2010, when it uh, failed and started and propagated down the the va- the the proximal valley before it entered Meager Creek and went into the Lillooet Valley. Uh, it was traveling 250 kilometers an hour, so it fails and then instantly it's going 250 kilometers an hour. It climbed up. Uh, like it came out of a valley and hit the opposite valley side of the the valley it was going to enter. And it went up 270 meters in elevation, flopped back down, went 100 meters elevation up on the other side. So it just became this like slurry that rocked back and forth yeah. in, in the main valley as it, as it went down the valley. Yeah, because even when you were describing this stuff prior to that, I was imagining like a big, slow, like a big, slow mudslide. But that's like... 250 miles per hour is incredibly fast. Like there's no warning, no time to no, get that, out or anything. So, so that's close to the source. And then once it, uh, so that might be within 10 kilometers or even 20 kilometers. And then once it starts to move into the bigger valleys and spread out, then it will slow down. So then it might be going, um, I, we tend, we generally think in terms of meters per second. So it'll, it'll slow down from like 90 meters per second to 60 meters per second to 10 to, f- to five even like so when you're very far away from th- the volcano from the source it's maybe traveling five meters per second or three meters per second which even is five meters a second is pretty fast yes it's like faster than you could probably run for a distance yeah so there's the velocity component and then the other the major component to what allows these things to uh, travel so far is the c- the composition so they're said to be clay rich so the and also it's a type of clay. So there's there can be clay is really just a descriptive term that talk that refers to very small particles. But those small particles can be small because they've been ground. So in which case they're just small on the they're small just because because of that mechanical breakdown. Other 
true clays. They're an actual mineral form. It's a platy deposit and they can be shrink swell. So when you add water, they get bigger and when you take water away, they shrink. And so when you, and so these volcanoes often have these shrink swell clays, uh, in them. And, um, so they hold a lot of water and they're very greasy. And so when you add water to a clay rich deposit, it just, it, it, it looks like concrete and it flows like concrete. And so it starts off going, you know, a couple hundred kilometers an hour and, 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 and incorporates ice and snow and river water, possibly dams a valley, creates a lake. And then when that lake bursts, it incorporates that water. And, and then are, there's also actually a lot of that water is there originally inside the mountain, right? Because we live in a wet, uh, rainy environment. And so there's actually a certain amount of water stored in the rock that fails and when the so then when the when the rock fails it pressurizes the water and then that causes liquefaction and then allows it to flow yeah i mean like you the way you talk about it is like the way that people talk about tsunamis coming in Mm -hmm. like how fast and and high up it's able to like like splashing off mountains it just seems like such a uh terrifying thing Mm -hmm. it's like a a tsunami of concrete Mm -hmm. that comes out of nowhere Mm -hmm. pretty much (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's fun that's exciting yeah (laughs) um what do you know about garibaldi lake oh well because isn't that that's i've heard rumor of that being like a pretty big liability for the town of squamish anyways Uh uh-huh um that perhaps is somewhat controversial uh at least my take on it is so the garibaldi lake there's a feature there called the barrier, mm-hmm. which is an old moraine, correct? Well, it's it lava. So again, Garibaldi was active when the ice was um, waning, and um, so there's lava flows uh, off the north side of Garibaldi, specifically a mountain called Price, and those lava flows came down and abutted glacier ice that was in the Chequemus Valley, and blocked the the upper well blocked the um the valley that get where garibaldi lake is and so then when the ice left you're left with this cliff that's called the barrier and then there's about a kilometer and a half of volcanic rock and then you get to garibaldi lake itself and so in 1856 there was a landslide off the barrier that was pretty big it was three million cubic meters or so and it it traveled into the valley bottom, filled the valley bottom below the barrier, and then um, and then over 50 years time or so, a lot of that material was reworked by by the Chequemus River itself and brought into the Squamish Valley in Paradise Valley, which comes into the Squamish River, and and caused that valley bottom to aggrade by a few meters. So, anyways, there is this landslide off grade meaning like build build up up. yeah Yeah. so there was this landslide off the barrier in 1856 and um they were going to develop a subdivision at the base of the barrier uh called garibaldi station back in the 70s when the approving officers recognized that there could be this a repeat of this type of a landslide and so they decided that they weren't actually going to allow the subdivision and they expropriated the private property and and now you're it's a no build area now um i we since know or i i know um because i've looked at the sections and dug the dirt and dated the samples and stuff that that type of event has only occurred twice in the last 10,000 years so there is one barrier collapse in 1856 and the previous barrier collapse was roughly 6,000 years ago so there's been two so it's relatively low hazard but it's still a significant hazard Um, but what you read about and and so what that is is their collapse is off this steep face that we call the barrier but when you look at Wikipedia you get a different story and the story there is that if all of that volcanic rock that that one and a half kilometers of volcanic rock between the barrier face and the lake were to suddenly fail, then Garibaldi Lake itself could drain. And um, that's what I don't agree with. I don't see that happening. So uh, I, uh, you know, I, 
I see, what I've seen in the landscape and what I think is real is these just collapses from the face rather than a complete removal of that volcanic plug and a draining of the lake. Um, the volcanologists will argue that if you go to Mount Meager, Mount Meager erupted 2,400 years ago and a massive amount of both hot and cold pyroclastic flow or lahar material filled the valley and created a volcanic dam that is probably three or four kilometers long. And that dam allowed a lake to form upstream called Paleo Lake Salal because it, it is fed by Salal Creek. And then that while that rock was still hot, the dam, the barrier rock was still hot, Lake Salal filled and then overtopped it. And then that overtopping of that still hot rock allowed all that rock to be stripped away by the outburst flood. And that formed a canyon that's like three kilometers long and, you know, 100 meters deep or something and half a kilometer wide. And so that canyon... Uh, is something that could happen but and so the volcanologists will say well if it can happen there why won't it happen at Mount Garib at the barrier at the at Garibaldi Lake and my argument is well the one at, at, at Meager formed when the rock was still hot and it was a brand new process that all kind of happened at the same time whereas here the barrier plug formed against ice the plug cooled it's been sitting there for 10,000 years and now it's unlikely to uh, get stripped away when it's overtopped so I see them being completely different situations but some might argue that by analogy with Mount Meager the one on the barrier could strip away and drain the lake but I don't buy it <laughs> good to know good to know <laughs> I like your take on that but you never know no but <laughs> what's the but the, the landslide <laughs> off the barrier yeah could go down and hit Daisy Lake, right? And so Daisy Lake is a man-made reservoir created by the Daisy Lake Dam. And so then if a landslide hits the reservoir, it could create a landslide-induced tsunami wave that overtops the reservoir and then um, comes down the Chequemus River. So that is... And potential, potentially lead in like reservoir failure. Yes. So that's the real hazard that exists there. Oh, okay. So there still is hazard from flooding and yeah. just not the actual... Uh, Garibaldi Lake flooding. Yeah. Okay. Good to know that at least like that one myth has <laughs> been debunked. <laughs> and like rivers are a really big erosional process, but maybe it's just been too young, like of a land formation here to have like really any major effects or what's your, what's your take on that? I don't know. Cause at one point the valley, like you said that the water levels here rose by 50 meters, but they were also a lot lower at one point as well. Uh, well on the here well in, in well here we were ice covered mm -hmm. but when so when the glaciers were at their at their maximum and the land was uh depressed that would make it higher uh but then farther away from the glaciers the land bulges up and like so you get you get this kind of crustal warping phenomenon and so then when the ice leaves the area where it's depressed it does that so it warps. But anyways, at the end of the last glaciation in, between Vancouver Island and Haida Gwaii and in, in the land between, or what's now ocean, but in Hecate Strait, the sea level was 120 to 150 meters lower. And then with sea level change following deglaciation, all of that land got flooded. Um, but here because everything was covered in ice, the sea level change pattern is different. Like it's different everywhere on the coast, depending on how far you, away, you are away from the ice mass, whether the ice, the ice covered the, that location for a long time or a short time. So you, you can go to, you know, every different location on the BC coast and have a different sea level curve, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, for some reason I thought I had read something that at one point, like the before the water levels were as high as they were here, there was actually like a, an open valley, like lower down, for the towards like Porto Cove and stuff. Because isn't there a, a terminal marine there that like makes that a great diving area right by Porto Cove? Yes. Yeah, so that's um, 
from Porto Cove across the Sound to the Defence Islands. Uh, the on the inside, on this side of of that feature. So there's a ter beautiful terminal moraine that's been imaged using side scan sonar from a ship, and it's just this striking feature. It's just classic. And on the inside, it, the water depths are like 200 meters, and on the outside, the water depths are. Uh, 100 meters, and on the crest of the moraine, the moraine crest is 30 meters below sea level. Wow! So it it comes up several close, hundred. Yeah. yeah, it comes up, and it's it's you know hundreds of meters tall. It's this it's massive triangular feature that that comes right across. So um, yeah, um, but it was formed um, during this um, sort of 12,000 years ago. The Valley Glacier here extended that far so there might have been that's this time when there was higher water outside of that and and um and then no water inside of that because there was ice and then as that glacier pulled away from that moraine there was already isostatic adjustment happening and sea level was falling so by the time the ice got to here where we are now the sea only flooded to that 50 meters elevation that we're talking about but it's never been to my knowledge, lower than, than, well, it's been a bit lower, but not significantly, not in the hundred, not a hundred meters lower. No valley bottom like this here existed no, down there. Yeah. No. Do you have anything else you'd like to add or share, <laughs> talk about? Did you hit everything on your little note list there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've gone well beyond that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I knew, I knew, I knew if we would just got out here and started freestyling, we'd be able to talk about stuff. <laughs> well, you're, you're uh, good at asking questions and summarizing things. So yeah, I'm yeah. trying to get better at that. Yeah. It's a difficult <laughs> thing. Um, before we go, uh, I sent you a message about it. I, I do a donation to a nonprofit of my guest choice for every uh, episode that I do here. Have you had a chance to think about who you'd like the donation uh, to go to? And oh, well, I haven't, I didn't realize that and I hadn't thought about it, but, um, uh, how about the Dogwood Society? The Dogwood Society? Yeah. Okay. Um, tell me about them. I don't know. I've never heard of them. Oh, you haven't? No. Well, you must have. I I would tell you if I had. Yeah. Well, the do Dogwood is a is a um one of our local environmental groups. Okay. That do advocacy for environmental causes in in British Columbia and Canada or whatever, and because they're political. They're um, non-charitable, or they're they're charitable, but you, they can't issue tax receipts mm -hmm, because they're a political organization. Yeah, and um, so, anyways, they'd be uh, they'd be a good one to sure. Yeah, and what kind of work have they done around here? Uh, all sorts of advocacy. Uh, if it was Squamish in particular, then it's um, my sea to sky. You could uh, give money to them. They're another one that's political. That uh, again don't can't issue tax receipts for that reason and they do lots of um positive environmental work in, in how sound yeah i know they've been doing a lot of work regarding everything happening with fortis right now um what's your take on the wood fiber thing are there any geological hazards over there mm, nothing out of the ordinary yeah yeah pretty standard yeah Okay. Well, I can, I will definitely uh, support the Dogwood Foundation, Dogwood Society. Sorry. What was it? Foundation. I'm not sure on the yeah. Dogwood. That, Dogwood. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll do that. And My to Sea, My sea to Sky, um, both great organizations. Before we go, I realized because we didn't really talk about it, but you mentioned the striations in like this rock we're talking about uh, that we're sitting on right now. Do you want to tell me about like some of the cool formations or, or cool textures that have formed on these rocks as a result of the glaciation? Sure. So when you're, um, when you're walking around on these surfaces on the Malmute or on the Chief, you'll see very shiny and smooth surfaces. And that's what we call the glacial polish. So it's just been buffed right up. And then in, in the glacial polish in places, you'll see scratches that are often quite long. And they're from... On, in the base of the ice, there might have been a rock frozen into the base of the ice that's being dragged by the ice and essentially scratching the ice and indicating then the direction of the ice movement. And so those are called glacial striations. Um, and then another feature that you see are these kind of half round little marks. So if the ice was going from up valley to down valley, you'd get these, it's almost like horseshoe like if you imagine a horse stomping its foot, 
like that. You see these, they're called chatter marks. So you see chatter marks and they can also indicate ice flow direction. And then... Wait, chatter marks, so that, that's like like the the glaciers like kind of skidding, like like when you hit your brakes on a bike and it's like... Yeah, that kind of thing. Really? That's created in the rock? Yeah. How much massive ice would have had to... A couple thousand meters. In order to put that, yeah. that much force on? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then you get uh, features like um, plucking. So you'll have a, a smooth-sided stoss side where the the polish forms and then on the downstream side you might get plucking so you get stoss and lee formations that's another indication what's what's plucking plucking is when the ice say will grab onto freeze into the rock and then as the ice moves away it pulls that hunk of rock with it so it'll smooth it'll be smooth on the up ice face and then plucked off on the down ice face Oh, wow. So Stoss and Lee landforms. Yeah, yeah they kind of look like little like teardrop things that have been like mm-hmm. pulled. Mm-hmm. That's how that's formed. Mm-hmm. Amazing. And th- and then another thing, under the glaciers, you, you'll have, you can have running water under high pressure even. And so then you can get uh, subglacial uh, fluvial erosion or r- river erosion. So then you get these really neat fluted forms. Is that like what's happened over towards like Echo Falls and all of those uh, formations? Well, that's not from glaciation. That's just from the river okay. eroding the rock. Is, yeah. is there an area that comes to mind where we've well, had that? I think where we parked our vehicles down there by the yeah. pullout near the Blue Bridge. You you see that, um, those features. I'm pretty sure that's what they are, although we could probably debate with some scientists on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join me here. Really appreciate having you on. It was, it was uh, super enjoyable. Thanks a bunch. Ah, what a great way to look around at the world, huh? Personally, I've always been really interested in the trees and the flora that makes up the landscapes and how they influence nutrient cycles and biodiversity, but I haven't spent much time zooming out and looking at the big picture of how those landscapes that everything lives amongst form in the first place. So it's really cool to learn about. Donations to local nonprofits like the Dogwood Society are made possible thanks to support from Patreons of Nerdy About Nature on Patreon. If you're enjoying these podcasts and all the fun educational videos I make all over social media and you want to support their production so they can continue to get better and better, you can do so by joining the Patreon family today for as little as a dollar a month or more at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature or by making a one-time donation or getting some... Um, what's... Um, what's... Um, what's... Thank you so much for tuning in this week. I'm looking forward to catching you next time for some more fun nerdiness. Cheers. This episode of the Nerdy About Nature pod chat series was produced by me, Ross Reed, and made possible with support from individuals like yourself. For ways to support this project and to learn more, check out nerdyaboutnature.com or at nerdyaboutnature on your favorite social platform.